Of the bullying cases led by women in the workplace, 80% of those cases are women on women. In this episode, we're going to explore lateral women on women aggression and bullying in the workplace. What is it? How does it play out? Reasons it happens? How to recognise it's happening? And why some women and men deny its existence? Why does it even matter? And can we stop it? And if so, how? This topic really challenges the myths about women and sisterhood. So settle in because it's going to be a big, insightful and possibly confronting conversation. You're listening to Wealthy Living Conversations. I'm Lisa, your host and founder of Wealthy Living. It's here that I connect with a variety of people to have inspiring, insightful and curious conversations to help you live a meaningful, connected and well life, both personally and professionally. An area that many women struggle or have struggled with is aggression and bullying by other women. I'm sure no doubt you've experienced this at some point in your life, whether it be through school, in families or in the workplace. So I'm so grateful to delve into this topic with Natalie Martinek, who is not only a special friend, a mentor, project partner, and one of my most favourite people to have insight chats with, but a woman who is well-versed on the complexities and nuances of this topic. And she's not afraid to bring awareness to the insights that often sit in the shadows. You may be familiar with Natalie's wisdom from some of the other Wealthy Living Conversations we've had. Um, I will drop those in the show notes if you're interested. So let me formally introduce you to Natalie. Natalie is an ex-systems biology and cancer researcher turned narcissism hacker, consultant and independent medical culture researcher. As a highly in tuned observer, Natalie has become acutely alive to the fact that toxic behaviors, behavior, behaviors masticize just like the tumors she once studied. As a global consultant for leaders, investors, and executives in healthcare, tech, and related industries, she specializes in helping individuals and teams navigate professional relationships that feature narcissistic behaviors. Her clients develop skills and strategies to successfully negotiate with corporate psychopaths and prevent so, um, psychological, financial, or reputational harm. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show today, Nat. Welcome. Thank you. Great to be here with you again. I know. It's always great. I love having these chats with you both when we record them and when we just have them unrecorded in just natural conversation. It's always good to get your insights. So let's get into it. Let's start by just going, what is woman-on-woman -woman aggression and bullying and how common is it? Yeah, so woman-on-woman uh, -woman aggression is pretty self-explanatory where you can have anything from, you know, the side eye uh, with the judgment um, between one woman and another uh, to verbal, you know, insults, accusations, uh, smear campaigns, piles on, pylons. Um, yeah, just you name it, the same thing that occurs between men or men with women. So anything that constitutes aggression that can escalate into targeted attack against one person with the intent to take her down, eliminate her, disgrace her, and um, like a form of revenge. Yeah. You know, you've written a lot about this lately. You've put up a lot of posts um, and written articles on this topic. Um, and it's received a lot of engagement, showing that a lot of women are really experiencing this. And the statistics show that that a lot of women are. And like I said in the beginning, that 80% of the bullying with women is women on women. And 
it's anecdotally the case too because when you put that up you had so many people engage and share and write you mm. personal messages of their experiences what were some of the main themes that came out and that really stood out from the comments of what what women were sharing and even what men might have been sharing well in the workplace um I'll, so much of the time when there's been complaints to managers about um, bullying colleagues, uh, there wouldn't be the appropriate escalation processes. There'd be some denial and some people, when they complain, they find out they don't have a job a week later. So there's some, you know, institutional process and systems that make it difficult um, to even complain about poor behavior. So there was no accountability. So over time, women learn about this and they don't bother blowing the whistle. They just suffer silently and either try to find an exit or they're forced out. So those are some, you know, some examples. Other examples are um, acknowledgement of incompetence or insecurity of the woman who's bullying the person who's, you know, commenting. Um, so it acknowledging a motive or, uh, you know, some, some deficit in the person that is causing them to lash out, um, competitiveness, comparison, uh, patriarchy, misogyny, internalized misogyny, racism, minority taxation, um, envy, you know, the, <laughs> there's a number of, number of things that it came up. It's quite a variety. Um, and I think it is common, not as common as men on men bullying, but it is quite common. So there's always a surprise from someone, some women, either that it's not more known and talked about, um, or they're surprised that they're not alone yeah. and that it's more common than, than they realized. Yeah. And I think that even though you say that it might not be as common as men on men, I think it's probably played out. I don't know, but is it played out differently? I think uh, what is what constitutes bullying isn't always picked up on between women. So, you know, the, the stats come from questionnaires and, and all sorts of evaluations. I'd like to see what those questions are, how clear cut they are. Are they able to pick up all behaviors? Is all the bullying behaviors or just some bullying behaviors? Because, you know, I suspect that number could even be higher. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I imagine, I imagine in some ways it would because I think of my own personal experiences and I've experienced bullying in the workplace both on a really, um, on a level that wasn't as obvious. So hmm. things like um, being told by men that some of the w women find me intimidating but without mm. even having a conversation with me to get to know me, but just based on whatever judgments, whether it be the position that I held within that company or um, and jealousy around that, or whether it was just the way I looked or my confidence, or I'm not sure what the reasons were, but that was something that I suppose wasn't di as direct and obvious that I would have then reported it. And then there was another example mm. where I was in a managerial position and my 2IC really wanted my position and then went and she, like you said, that lack of confidence, but then she went and mm. did a smear campaign to the people that were in power to try to get my job. And that was mm. an obvious situation. But again, I was in a powerless position because she done the, I suppose, sucking up or whatever it was, the ego, yeah. ego you know, massaging that <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to be heard. So, um, yeah, it's it's interesting um, and it probably, you know, that's just my personal experience. So mm. I imagine so much of it is underreported. Yeah, I've got, I mean, I've got stories. Um, but you raised really important, you know, things I want to pick up on. Um, the first example you gave was the men reported to you what the women were saying about you, whether it was true or not. So this is another thing that came out in the comments. One of the themes that I've written about is the role that men play in stoking this fire. So they're spreading gossip instead of, you know, keeping their mouth shut because now it creates, you went from kind of being ignorant about how other people feel about you to now knowing that 
you intimidate other people, whereas the men could have kept that quiet or said, you know, a lot of people admire you and, you know, you're doing great work. That wouldn't have caused anything, but they are creating something that is now going to make you see your workplace differently and start to pay attention to, to things to confirm this new bit of evidence that's been presented to you. So them spreading gossip like that is problematic. The other thing that men tend to do is when they stay right the hell out when they see there's drama between women. So they don't intervene. They just keep to themselves. And I'm not suggesting that that's they're supposed to intervene. But, um, you know, the not doing anything about it, not kind of talking to managers or other players um, about it because it does impact on their work um, is, you know, it's part of the murkiness. And, you know, when we're talking about bullying, what we're not talking about is also how aggression, bullying doesn't just start in one hit, doesn't happen overnight. There's a series of uh, behaviors that progress to bullying and you could, you know, see the early aggressive, early aggressions or aggressive behaviors um, or even the subtle behaviors that can give you some indication that it can escalate to bullying, but those aggressions are not necessarily studied. It's just the overt bullying behaviors that get studied, but the aggression gives you some insight of how, you know, pervasive or insidious the toxic behaviors are in a workplace. Um, so, because they would already be there if you have high bullying in a workplace, it's because there's already these markers of toxicity within the culture itself. So there's, yeah, men play a part in this, whether they're passive or active, they're participants. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is true and it's complicated and it has so many levels and it is always hard to know when to intervene, when not to intervene. I mean, you see it even played out in school schoolyards and, mm -hmm. you know, there's the bully and the person who's being bullied, but even then it's often hard to, who started it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so, who started it? That's yeah. right. And so, so maybe should we talk about that? How does it start? Where, like, what are the, like, what's the catalyst? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, because one of the other things is the, you know, the mean girls in high school or the way we're socialized from birth in our families and the, you know, sibling rivalries and the kind of hierarchy that's established in families that can, that gets reinforced in educational settings, uh, you know, who's the best student or who's the best athlete and you know everyone's always trying to be the best so it's really because of competition and competitive environments some people blame capitalism so there's lots of conditions that enable um or facilitate this aggression and bullying so how does it start well it's not necessarily a logical thing but you say we're in a workplace context a new woman comes in and she's pretty accomplished and maybe is attractive or doesn't matter, but something about her is seen as threatening uh, to another person in that, uh, in, in that workplace or in that team. So that person who feels threatened is gonna act out their insecurity because you're only threatened if you're feeling insecure or inferior or inadequate. You know, this, the person of this, you know, change is threatening. Um, new people can feel threatening. Doesn't mean your life's at stake. It just means you're now uncomfortable. Um, there's some uncertainty and you're, you're feeling a bit insecure about your status and position now because of this new person. So if you're not aware that this is what you're feeling, um, you're going to start to just see that person as, you know, you'll be suspicious of that person. You'll see them as a problem, a troublemaker, not to be trusted. So you will start to do things to... Um, let her know that she's not as powerful as she might think or want to want to believe that you're the boss or you're in the know, even if you're in the same you know position or a similar level, um, or you might be the manager or you might be you know lower down in the in the hierarchy. It doesn't matter. Something about this woman is threatening and brings out your insecurity because of the comparison um, in a competitive environment, and you're doing on not necessarily intentionally. I think a lot of the time it's unintentional. It's just a reaction. It's an immature emotional response to uh, feeling threatened and not having the awareness of your trigger. And so you go to make them wrong. Um, 
and you start to do things to try to devalue, diminish, silence, uh, exclude, um, isolate, uh, and you're not necessarily noticing that this is what you're doing. Uh, and you might also start talking badly about this person to your colleagues to try to undermine her and have them, you know, see her in a more doubtful way. So she's not as excellent as she comes across. Mm. So those are some examples. It's something about this person. Either she reminds you of someone you have a bad relationship with or something about her makes you feel threatened. And um, and that's it. That's all it takes. Sadly. Yeah. It's interesting because it, it's so no matter what topic I talk about on this podcast and there, you know, there's a lot of different topics on this podcast series and everything always comes back to self-awareness and being conscious of your triggers. So <laughs> it's so interesting because, I mean, we will go into later in the episode of what we can do about it and how can we even change it. But one of the things is that ability to be really self-aware and to know that, I mean, conversations like this alert people to know that these things happen and that mm. that um, to start being, you know, taking accountability of when, when you might be playing a role in the dynamic. And mm. I think everybody always plays a role in every dynamic, but some people um, aren't necessarily conscious of what roles they're playing. And so to really come back to that connection to self peace and really be aware, like being able to witness yourself um, as you're behaving in certain mm. ways. And it's difficult and it takes so much practice. But I think a lot of the work, if we were going to sort of improve in this area, um, yes, it's not the only thing and it's not just personal accountability. It's obviously, and we'll talk about it later, the accountability of the organisation or the system, mm. or the workplace, etc. But um, but self accountability and being aware of how we behave in different situations is definitely an area and a piece that 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 has is important. Mm. I agree, um, but yeah, like you said, it's not easy. How do you become self aware if you're not self aware? Yeah. <laughs> like you know, what's a transition point? And it requires support, and it requires yeah, a desire um, to change. Whereas when we're talking about women who, uh, you know, with their fragile egos who feel insecure, um, they're reactive. And so they go straight to blame and, you know, they feel shame and they go to project it. And so they blame others for their own experience. And then they make that person the perpetrator and the one who's insecure is the victim and does everything to alert everyone of this bad person, this perpetrator, not realizing it's all, um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily real. There's no real threat here. It's just you feeling insecure. Deal with your, deal with your insecurity and stop making it everyone else's problem that it turns into this workplace trauma. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, so if yeah. we took that a little bit step further and took it away from what leads a person I mean especially let's just stick to women for this for the sake of this conversation leads to their insecurities and look at the impact of social programming and how girls mm. are conditioned to align with power no matter who holds the power for their own protection mm. yeah I think so that's a pretty broad statement. Women are kind of conditioned or programmed to align with power. I'm not sure if it's with power. I think it's with authority. Everyone's looking to for love from a daddy figure or some, you know. Yeah, that's what uh, I mean. Just to, yeah, it, it, to feel safe, you know. Yeah, we want security. We want protection. We want to feel safe. It's a, you know, it's it's a mad world out there. So yeah, we do we do want that. And based on the way we were brought up, that will give us or condition us or socialize us to seek out um yeah the protection and the comfort of authority and so institutions are authorities bosses are authorities parents are authorities certain people who might be your friends or colleagues can in a hierarchical relationship can be the authority so whoever the per whoever is perceived as being the most powerful in a room in a group 
a lot of people will want to be closer to them and do what they want and please them. So even if they do something bad or harmful to someone else, they tend to be protected for it as well because their survival, their, you know, this primal need for protection and defense and, and um, comfort and certainty uh, is all part of our survival mechanism so that we're always going to protect and justify and do whatever is necessary for our own well-being. Mm. And so in a competitive environment like a workplace, survival is also associated with uh, success and achieving goals or climbing the ladder. So again, it's the same thing. You're going to look for who's that authority who's going to make that happen for me. And what do I need to do to get in alignment or proximity with them so that they can meet my needs? And we're not necessary. Some people are ca quite calculating about it and strategic and others are mostly unconscious and just are just know to who, who the most powerful one is. And uh, I need to work with them. I need to, to get on their good side. Mm -hmm. And this is part of our makeup. It's how do we survive without it? How do we look out after ourselves if we haven't developed the maturity or the capacity to not need to use those approaches to seek some external authority to be part of my success story or my survival story, then use my inner authority and work with other people without trying to have this extractive or exploitative, um, you know, give and take relationship. For some people, the give and receive relationship is what they're seeking and they would go about their success in a very different way than using aggression and bullying tactics. Mm. Yeah, and you see it played out time and time again. And it's, you know, in a way it's really sad because the feminist movement has really come a long way in that we have more women, um, say, in the workplace and we have more women slowly getting into leadership positions. But I just wonder how many of those women are going against their natural nature and masking their 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 nature in order to join let's call it the boys club you know and so mm -hmm. are we actually getting more feminine qualities up at leadership level or are we just getting a lot of assimilated um females well in order to succeed in certain industries uh you do need to conform you do need to assimilate you need to be what will be seen as trustworthy um so you will em try to emulate either consciously or just unknowingly uh in order to fit in in order to be able to you know achieve your your goals uh if climbing that hierarchy climbing that ladder smashing glass ceilings etc is is you know your mission um, and for some women, again, I don't like to generalize about women's nature, um, masculine, feminine, because everyone has a different composition of those, those qualities, uh, in whatever bodies they're in. Um, so, but let's look about, look, let's look at who establishes institutions, you know, the workforce, the corporate world, everything in, in society or mostly in society has been established by men and the thinking that they bring. So for women to be able to uh, successfully navigate and enter into positions of leadership, they're entering into institutions that were built for people who are not like them. So they need to find ways to be able to naturally succeed in those places. So of course, they're going to have to embody certain qualities or characteristics, attributes that make them seem trustworthy so that they can get ahead as well as having the skills and abilities and the intelligence and, uh, you know, what the intellect to be able to um, not only do the jobs, but also to form the right relationships with the right people in the right way. Um, so, but with what we're seeing um, with many of these women who've worked decades to get into these high positions of leadership, they're walking away from them because they're realizing what's valuable to them. Not all women, some people, some women are doing quite well in these leadership roles and doesn't seem like it's had such a detrimental toll on their well-being or that's what they're messaging um, because they want to show that women can 
achieve these things or attain these things too. But uh, I think for not just women, I think for many men, you have to assimilate and be the ideal um, in order to get to the levels that you want. And even for women, they'll never get to the levels that men have been able to attain, or at least the the volume um, that men or the the percentage of men. Um, and and the question we should be asking is why do we want to? Why should we want to? Why is that even something we want to attain in order to prove our equality, to prove that we're as good as? Why do we need to do that? It's it's this is this is not the game because it comes at a cost of burnout, moral injury, um, you know, suppression of needs, suppression of values in order to assimilate and become what the system requires of you in order to for you to get what you want from it. But when you get to the top and you're there, you're like, is that all? Now what? <laughs> Not to say that, that I've gotten there, but I can imagine, you know, you work so hard and you go through a lot to be able to get to these positions. You endure a lot and then you're in it and you're like, okay, you know, how long do I have to be doing this? Yeah. And it's such a good question to ask. <laughs> and, and I think it's a really tough question, as simple as it sounds. It's a really tough question to explore. Easy to ask yeah. and tough to explore because it is so, the answer is so complex. The answer is so conditioned. Um, you know, we talked about conditioning before and um, mm. and social conditioning and family conditioning and everybody's received a different, a different set of values that's been instilled yeah. into them and a different set of beliefs. But going back to that idea that is very common with girls and the need to prove themselves in order to feel mm. worthy. And I know that I've um, I know that I've personally been in stages in my life that I felt like that, but I've also had many clients who have that same story. And mm. I've seen it over and over with colleagues and friends and in different scenarios and in different countries and different nationalities and you know, it's yeah. a story that is played over and over again that stems probably from um, from being brought up in a patriarchal system, and that yeah. that need that that need to be valued. And we all have male or female or or whatever you know somebody identifies with the need to be feel valued. And yeah. I think that often, often women are trying so hard to prove themselves in order to feel worthy. And that's not something that just through a question of why can be resolved. Yeah. But well, it's a good starting place. <laughs> it is a good starting place. But what we're talking about is the competitive environment. So, regardless of whatever social systems are um, playing out, like, uh, you know, you mentioned patriarchy, which is, you know, family system of male dominance, male domination and authority. Um, but there's also the, you know, men are superior and women are inferior mentality as well. And so, of course, that establishes a competitive environment where, you know, in order for women to meet their needs and get a quote unquote get ahead, they have to prove their superiority or at least their quality. So this is the game, this rigged game, because no matter what, women are never going to get to the point of being what has been created by men for men. So why are we even trying to enter or try to compete? That's the thing. Like, why are we trying to compete in this rigged game? There are other ways, there are other games to play that doesn't require this kind of, you know, mental and physical gymnastics in order to prove something. And I think when women start to ask these questions, they're like, what am I trying to prove? Who am I trying to prove it to? Why am I even competing? I don't need to compete with anyone. I'm competing with myself. Unless I'm in this workforce, then yes, it's a competition because there's limited spots, there's limited resources, which is why everyone's vying for love and affection and approval from the authority because there's limited authorities. So, and if they're seen as holding all the power and the resources, of course, you're going to want, you know, to get in with them to get some of that so it makes sense but it comes back to the self-awareness stop yourself and go why am I doing these things especially considering the toll it's taking on me if it's not taking a toll on me and I can manage it sure go right ahead but if it is 
why am I doing this? And what other games are available for me that doesn't require me to kill myself in order to attain these levels of success mm -hmm. at the rate that I'm hoping to attain it? So yeah. these are important questions um, yeah. that women, as well as everyone else, should be asking themselves. Yeah. I think from everything that you said, a big theme that comes out for me in that is this concept of denial and why mm -hmm. are, and, and in many different ways, like why are there women who are denying that they're being competitive to get to a place and they're just going, no, like, you know, that makes me really happy and I really want that. Like they're, they're w not willing to explore the possibility that they are playing a game and they're in denial that they're doing that and then there's men who are in denial that women need to do that and that it's fair game and then there's um you know then there's denial when we go back to the bullying argument the bullying situation of why are so many men and women denying that bullying even exists mm. like this whole denial concept on so many levels of what we've just talked about um, and even the denying of needing to ask ourselves and reflect on the situation. Why, yeah. why is that happening? Why is there such a theme of denial? Because status quo is easier to deal with than disrupt it, challenging or disrupting it. So denial is a way of preserving status quo, of just accepting things as they are and just getting on with it. Um, which is an important thing to do in general, just like this is this is the landscape, this is what we're dealing with. I accept that that exists and I'm going to find my way to work with it. But I'm not denying the existence of all the crazy shit that is, this social landscape is contributing to. Whereas the denial you're talking about is denying that there's even crazy shit that's happening and it's just everything's fine. You know, what bullying? What are you talking about? Oh, they're just having a bad day or it's only, you know, it only happens a small percentage of the time. It's not frequent. Um, so we're protecting status quo. And one of the, one of the status quo, I think that so many women have worked hard to, uh, I guess, want to believe or achieve is that there's this sort of sisterhood or that women lift each other up or we should lift each other up. So by acknowledging that there is woman on woman aggression and bullying, it's almost as if that threatens that narrative mm -hmm. that women lift each other up. They coexist. There are examples, many examples of women lifting each other up, not because they're trying to, you know, play this little rigged game um, to get ahead in some way. They see that our success is, is interdependent and we should be working together. And that coexists with examples of women, you know, trampling on each other and, uh, you know, undermining each other in order to succeed in a different way. So, but by acknowledging you know, one, it can potentially hurt the other. And that's why some women deny it. The other reason people deny these bad behaviors is that they're the perpetrators of bad behaviors and they can't see that they're doing it. Um, and this is an example of what I saw in my comments when I talked about women bullying women. They start, you know, there's some examples uh, that I saw in the comments that were deflecting and distracting and trying to make a new problem to, you know, distract away from the problem that we're the post was about mm -hmm. and then when I you know push back a little and said why are you talking about this you know we're talking about bullying here and here you are talking about this other thing why are you going there um you know there was just a lot of blame language and things like that so I was like okay this is an interesting phenomenon this is what denial looks like because you're trying to protect protect this ver version of reality that is so fragile for you that you're willing to show aggression towards another woman to preserve your reality and not seeing that you're just proving my point. Um, so that's, you know, just want to protect status quo. Mm. It's just sad. It is things sad. need to change. Change is part of life and change comes, you know, unexpectedly or comes, you know, when we plan for it or deliberately. So um, things are going to change but some people are resistant to it. And so denial is a good way of just saying there's no problem here, nothing to see here and keep their head buried in the sand. Yeah, and I think there's the denial as well of women that have had a really hard time and experienced either bullying or experienced having to wear a mask or really move away from their true nature in order to get to leadership positions or positions of, of power, let's say. 
and um, and are not are suffering. Their well-being is suffering, but they're also in denial of that, and they blame mm. other reasons. I just didn't have a good sleep, or and they're not thinking, well, why didn't you have a good sleep? Or mm. there, you know, there's a whole lot of different yeah. reasons why women um, will put will justify um, why they might not be feeling so well, but it takes. Yeah them to come to complete burnout or adrenal fatigue or you know or something mm. that that they can't actually ignore anymore in order to make a change and it's just so interesting to observe how often that happens and how disconnected somebody come becomes from their own bodies from their own self um, that they cannot even recognize what they're doing in order to get to this position until they literally have no choice. Yeah, but what are they doing? They're protecting status quo. They're protecting the institution. They're protecting the work. They're protecting their profession. They're protecting all these other things and throwing themselves under the bus, living in this denial and, and not seeing that there's a direct relationship between the stress that they're experiencing in a workplace and the stress that's you know manifesting as these symptoms in their body. Um, but they're, to admit that they're in a toxic environment and they're, you know, their workplace is failing them and all this other stuff's happening, that's a disruption to their status quo, to their, you know, their reality. And, uh, you know, they're going to do everything in their power before they will uh, surrender. Um, yeah. But they will eventually have to surrender because their body's breaking down or they're experiencing trauma, you know, symptoms and they can't keep showing up to work because their work is suffering and their performance is suffering and that will get noticed and then they get performance reviewed and, and, you know, and manage and all that stuff. So they, it won't, they won't be able to be in denial forever. <laughs> yeah. So talking about that, because burnout is, and we've done a whole conversation on burnout. Yes. And I'll, I'll put the link of that in the comments, but you know, burnout is something that is in the, is written about a lot lately. It's been in lots of publications and news <clears throat> You know, a lot of people are talking about burnout, especially post post um, pandemic or post lockdowns, and um, and I just want to talk about a little bit, not necessarily just about burnout, but it just made me think about this, about what is the role? Like we talk about reasons that happens, and we've talked about you know the the what goes on in society and what goes on for the individual, but what about institutions or organizations or workplaces like how accountable do they need to be like what are they denying what are they um refusing to take accountability for um and be willing to at the expense of their employees um mm -hmm. rather than you know really taking accountability of what role they're playing yeah it's a great question um so I think workplaces have been designed for the work, not for the relationships, but you can't have one without the other unless you work solo and all you're doing is data entry or something. You never have to talk to anyone. Um, but if you're an organization where you're working in teams and working with different people, relationships are vital uh, for your performance, for uh, you know your motivation, for meaning, for whatever it is that you're doing there. As, as in addition to the work that you have to do. But institutions, processes haven't really thought too much about the importance of relationships. It's kind of been secondary. So their policies might say, these are our values. This is the things that we want. And so that's part of their you know, impression management. These are the things that are important to us, but they don't necessarily want to admit that the behaviors are not reflecting their values. Their behaviors... Uh, within the culture are um, quite different to what they think are their values. And so um, if there isn't a process where they're visiting, okay, these are our values and what are the things, you know, how are we demonstrating them and how are we, what are the barriers to demonstrating them and how do we know that these are the barriers, what's actually happening in our, you know, unless they're asking these questions and prepared to make some changes and these are the leadership from above, um, Nothing's going to change. You're just going to assume, but these are our values and we have these policies. And if you're not living up to the values or these policies, then, you know, 
you can be compliant, you know, there could be some complaints and some follow up according to whatever way that they escalate and follow up on these things. Um, but when it comes to bullying and, uh, well, aggression and bullying, in order for, you know, say human resources or whatever authority to take complaints seriously, you need to have some really strong evidence to support you. You can't just say they're treating me like shit. This is what they've said. This is what they do. Yes, we need to take that seriously. Um, but we're also going to need to hear the other side from, you know, the other person's perspective. And you're going to get two different stories uh, and they can't resolve that. There isn't things in place to resolve that. So unless there's very strong evidence that documentation, this happened on this day, it was witnessed. And there's like, you know, a series of events that show a gradual escalation, then it becomes clear cut. Yes, this is bullying. And these are our processes. This is the way we manage it. Um, then it becomes a lot easier. But if you're a whistleblower, so you might have this evidence, you're a whistleblower, but there's, uh, you know, you're, you're calling out or you're exposing somebody who's held in high esteem in an organization, um, you're not going to get the outcome that you're hoping for because this person is going to be protected because somehow mm -hmm. they're important or they're seen as important for the success of the organization or the team or whatever. So they're going to do everything to protect that person and make and scapegoat you, even though you have all this evidence to support your claim. So then you have to end up going through a legal process, which is expensive and drawn out and, you know, potentially re-traumatizing if it, it was a bullying incident, bullying incident. Um, so the, the system in place is also imperfect because of these relationships. We're all, the relationships are, if there's a person that we deem is so, so important for organization, yet we keep getting complaints about them. Normally you would go, okay, what is this person doing? We need to like, you know, manage this, but no, they're like, no, we need to protect this person. We need to justify, we need to do everything in our power to make the problem go away, which is the victim. Mm. So yeah, Whew. that's, yeah. That's so so you're dealing that. There's yeah, so it's a relational stuff because we're always going to we're always going to protect what we think is important for our own survival and success. It's not logical, it's primal, it's emotional. Um but unfortunately, this is what workplaces are not admitting. They're not they're in denial about this, the importance of proximity to power and privileging certain people and um you know, scapegoating other people. They're not they're in denial that this exists and this is a you know, a huge <laughs> fraction of how we work we enter into hierarchical relationships or we form them because this is what this is just the competitive environment and so they don't see that this just keeps playing out in these workplaces because they say oh well we have these processes in place just follow due process but they're not there aren't enough people accountable to the process um and if they're in denial that there's actual problems in the workplace because they don't want to admit that their workplace has some problems because it goes against their impression and their reputation that they're trying to uphold then they're just going to do everything to sweep it under the rug or you know get rid of the problem which is often a victim <sighs> wow <laughs> yeah that and it's so common so it's a, across much. every industry there is so much or, in that net <laughs> there is so much gold and I don't even like this I was frantically you know writing down all different words that came out and I don't even know where to go first with that mm. because there is so much truth and there's also so much doom and gloom you know like yeah just, you know like institutions are un yeah to, they're they're not self-aware they're not self-aware and you know I think that a lot of organizations you know i work in well-being in 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 mm. corporate well-being and i do know that well-being is so called um you know the number one agenda item for a lot of companies at the moment but more so in saying so than like you said the impression management than necessarily in action um and maybe at a much more superficial than a deep level that it needs to be um, but I do know that a lot of managers and a lot of CEOs and, you know, or, um, you know, senior management teams do have good intentions, 
but they themselves, I don't think, have got the skills and capability. This is not why they were employed into those positions. Mm, They're employed into those positions because they're great with strategy or marketing or finances or whatever it is, but they're not necessarily great with the relational intelligence. I'm just wondering is with this process and when you were talking about the process of what somebody has to do and the evidence that they have to gain in order to be even heard, in order for it to be anything to be done about, it also brings up for me the same situations that aren't just in workplaces but also occur in domestic violence situations and in a lot of situations where women um, and men, but let's just say in this case predominantly Mm. women, um, give up because the energy that it actually takes to go forward and get to the stage of being heard and gathering enough evidence and going through the due process will lead to burnout before often just compliance will lead to burnout. They both end up Mm. in the same place, but sometimes the energy that it actually takes in order to go through with um, what you know is, is wrong um, or occurring will lead you to burnout and not get you the result needed um, before even just going, oh, stuff it, I'll just go along with it. Yeah, yeah. So you just relent, you know, you just submit to the dominant force that is going to make it is the path of least resistance so that you can attain what you want or buys you time as you try to transition out and go into a different workplace. So what you touched on is the the crux of it in my mind is that senior leaders, managers, you know, CEOs, and, you know, everyone across the hierarchy in an organization is in denial about the level of unwell-being or unwellness that exists within the workplace. Mm. And this is the message I keep telling everyone. When you go into an institution, any institution, I don't care what industry you're in, you need to start assuming that it is already unwell. It is not a well place. Everyone's going to be nice and great and welcoming and lovely, you know, when you first join an organization and you're starting, you know, you're settling in and, you know, everything, you know, you're in the honeymoon phase in a new job, especially if you left a shittier situation, you're going to be looking to fulfill this fantasy that there might be, this place might be better than the last. Um, And then the cracks will start to show, but the cracks are always there. Every institution is unwell because of what we've just said, they've established it for the work, not for the relationships. When, unless the institution was cultivated, was built from the ground to consider the importance of relationships in order to be able, as a vehicle to do the work, then, uh, or facilitator of the work, then you'll have a very different experience because there'll be things and processes in place um, and monitoring and evaluation and feedback and all these different things in order to ensure that we are building and sustaining a culture where trust is at its core, Mm. not loyalty, not, you know, we feel good about each other, that there's actual trust and respect across the board. It's mutual. And we have ways of actually being able to articulate it, measure it, um, you know, deal with disagreements and conflicts that doesn't involve aggression, that doesn't involve bullying and undermining, but there's a way that we can work things out. And that requires a lot more work than just ticking off your KPIs, uh, that you've achieved your KPIs, because that's work related. It's not relational focused. So every institution is unwell. That's what you have to know right from the get-go. And that way you're not sitting in denial and get so shocked and surprised when someone, you know, you you start to experience someone's aggression towards you. You're like out of the blue and you don't know what you did. Uh they might be having a bad day or, you know, you just reminded them of someone they don't like or whatever, or you said something in a meeting that made them, you know, that took the spotlight away from them. And now they're pissed at you. Like you don't know, but you're now on the receiving end of aggression that happens in unwell workplaces. Mm. It happens in all unwell. It it happens, Mm. you know, Everywhere. You know, everywhere. <laughs> Every, you know, everywhere. Every context. Know, even in, yeah. in, in family dynamics and friendships yeah. and, you know, in lots of places, actually. Yeah. So you can't have well-being initiatives if you're in denial about the degree of unwellness and sickness and illness that is your institution. Yes. You can't. It, it's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. But it's just 
band-aid and a way for them to you know again part of their impression that they're trying so hard to live into that we're caring organization that you know everyone's valued we're inclusive they, they're all these nice words but they failed to have built that as part of their process they haven't been able to go from fantasy or ideal into action yeah. and accountability and like you said they're ill-equipped because their training hasn't necessarily been about relationships and cultivating these types of relationships it's been about attaining the skills and the um intellect and knowledge in order to do the work yeah and I mean a lot of a lot I must say that you know on the flip side a lot of organizations are realizing that leaders need more skills and they are doing a lot of leadership trainings I'm just not necessarily I just don't think all leadership trainings are necessarily created equal and maybe mm. you know maybe there's also just maybe they're not also going deep enough into some of some of these things that we've talked about they don't need leadership training they need relationship training yeah but i think a lot of the leadership <laughs> training now like like i know when i run things to do with leadership i'm really running things to do with relationships that's um, yeah that's you and that yeah personal development yeah. sort of skills yeah exactly um you know, at least there's this acknowledgement, but then they're creating, you know, when I look online, you know, online is just like a snapshot of, you know, a collective consciousness or an interest, um, you know, all this talk about compassionate leadership and, you know, effective leadership, and it's creating this new fantasy person, this new savior. And again, which is going to be hard to attain and sustain, and it creates this, it'll end up you know, it's it's putting all this energy into this new ideal or this new fantasy of what leadership is. And again, it's always focusing on the individual and isn't putting as much emphasis on the skills and the techniques and the qualities that are required to cultivate the types of relationships that are not performative. Look, I'm a great leader because look at me, I'm, I'm showing you empathy and I'm really listening and I'm helping you feel heard, you know, ticking another damn box. It's not, it's still, you know, have to go from this performative into embodied and again that takes skills of people who are not necessarily trained in corporate leadership because they're trained in helping people become this you know ideal that will fit the institution but isn't necessarily what is required these days mm. it brings my brings to my mind the term psychological safety which gets thrown right. around and thrown <laughs> around and thrown around <laughs> and as an idea is, you know, well, that's what we need. We need psychologically safe workplaces, but who's actually stripping that back? Who's mm. actually stripping that back and going, what does that actually mean? And who's mm. deciding what it means? Like how many people are having conversations with all different parts of um, of people, you know, all different levels within the organisation and all different employees and who's having the input of deciding what actually makes someone feel psychologically safe like where and that's that yeah. that idea of trust so yeah it brings that to mind and i think that at least the conversations are happening they're probably just not um again it becomes a you know a performative term yeah so yeah i mean i think the concept is great it's amy edmondson so she's you know written books she's her her concept her practice um but it's like everything that becomes popular gets watered down diluted m interpreted in different ways um and it becomes again the new savior we need this thing called psychological safety and everything will be fine <laughs> mm. um, and yeah true but uh yeah yeah if it's not the priority then yeah it's yeah. anyway <laughs> like there's lots of different Lots of different things that can support uh, the elimination of aggression between people in a workplace. Um, but we have to also consider what is it about the culture and the environment that's causing people to be stressed out that it brings out aggression. We don't feel aggressive when we're feeling calm and happy and safe and comfortable. It comes out when we're feeling threatened, insecure, inadequate, you know, we're comparing, it's it's because we're triggered in some way. And so we react as to defend ourselves and protect ourselves with this 
type of, you know, aggression, what can be considered aggressive behavior, um, which could be the tone of voice. It could be the words you use that come out like daggers instead of something that's, you know, feels better, gentle. Um, it's our body language. It's the way we're using our nonverbal, you know, our eye, our, you know, like I said, the side eye, that, that can be a very aggressive move. Um, it could be, you know, your approach. You could tell that you're not being totally honest with the other person, or the other person can tell you're not being on totally honest with them or upfront. Um, you know, like there's so many ways we could demonstrate aggression when we're not, when we're suspicious of the other person, because, you know, everything comes back down to trust. And yeah. if we haven't built and done the, the work to build and sustain trust with someone else, then we're going to lash out in these ways. Yeah. And yeah. even if we have that trust, if I have a moment where I lash out, the other person will be like, Hey, wow, are you okay? This is, you know, like I'm, I'm sensing, you know, some strong energy in you today. Are you okay? Do you want to talk about it versus a, yeah, yeah. That's the other a, way, which we go, line. we tend to be defensive right back. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I mean, I think that that is the bottom line. It's about building relationships. And I think that it's slowly, we are slowly, let's use the term humanizing workplaces and I know it gets thrown around but we are becoming better with our interpersonal skills and I think crossing over between not having such um this is what you do in the workplace and this is what you do in your personal life and people are starting and maybe the work from home and the hybrid working arrangement has allowed people into people's homes a little bit more mm. and there is a little bit more crossover because it does take getting to know somebody at a in a variety of ways in order to build the trust and even including and I don't want to go through this in this conversation because it's a whole nother conversation but even um the way that somebody's mind works or their neurodiversity or any of those things you're not going to know that and you might be triggered by it if you don't get to know somebody and yeah. so I think it's really important that that is that is a piece and that I think that sort of let's call it team bonding or team building or all of those things that were done um, maybe by the by the water cooler or, you know, all those different times where you have yeah. other conversations, they're important. They're just as important as, you know, as formal meetings talking about it to get to know somebody, to build their trust and see them in a different light and then be right. able to have those conversations that if they are, Oh, you know, like you said before, oh, that sounds a bit um that feel, that feels a bit funny. Are you okay today? You know, like that 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 came across in a certain way. Did you mean it like that? And actually mm. be a little bit more curious within the conversation um mm. when you get to know somebody a little bit better. Yeah. But we are talking about women on women, right? So these all sound what you've just said sounds what we're talking about sounds really reasonable and logical. But there's Again, we can do all those things, but they don't necessarily translate over time. We can have this trust and then something could happen that can betray that trust and then the things start to go downhill. So there's just so many, so mm. many little things that become barriers um, or enable barriers to, you know, harmonious relationships or become enablers of aggressive aggression like you can have trust between two women and then a third person a third woman comes along and you're like who's this woman she, we're suspicious of her we're trying to build a relationship with her but you know she's not really vibing with us so now we're going to see her as a threat and now we're going to do our thing to kind of get rid of her because we don't like her vibe like this is what happens <laughs> right this is the yeah. reality this and is so the reality slap. I'm not protecting <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not protecting any institution. I have very little, very little, I'm different to you. I have very little hope or not even hope. I don't even think they are capable of the change because like I said, the foundation is faulty. And unless you destroy the whole thing and rebuild from scratch, you you can do all these changes. And I'm sure over time it can happen, but it might even be faster if you get the hell out and form something new and develop something. If you have the, the abilities to build a business because you've done it before, then you have the ability to do it in a different, you know, not not have the ability to do it in a different way. You have to learn it, but you can start to bring in, okay, relationships matter and we're gonna build something, but we're gonna put relationships at the center. And this is what we're gonna need to do differently in addition to the, the tasks involved in building, you know, an empire or whatever. 
but we have to do things a little bit differently. And I see that, I see that's happening, but I have very little faith in existing institutions to be able to make the changes because they're still living in denial. They're still in denial of how unwell their institution is. And they can't admit that their institution's unwell because that could have you know, implications for funding, for reputation, for all sorts of things. So no one's gonna admit it. So I have zero, very little to zero faith that anything substantial is gonna change. And it's only people who are waking up and going, we deserve better than what yeah. is being offered to us. And yeah, I'm, I'm putting very little energy into the that. The power lies within the people having the courage to stand up, walk away and do it differently. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it is really sad and, you know, you're right, I probably try to hold on to a little bit more hope than you and try to be a, try as much as possible to, you know, have some influence or um, some guidance in there. But, yeah, you're right, it is, it, it does, it is a little bit gloom and doom. Yeah, and it no, it's wonder, reality. I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the funding stuff, is real and I think that mm. that is beyond just the institution that is yeah. that looks at society and the way society is run and like you touched on slightly in the beginning when you were I think a bit hesitant to say it but the idea that some people believe it's from capitalism but you know it is that oh. it is that um that structure or that way that, that we live and if you take like even putting corporate aside because that's private might mm -hmm. be a little bit different but if you take an institution or um, like the medical institution um, and the medical system or something like that. I mean, the last episode that I did on this podcast was with a Amy, the good nurse. And, you know, we, you know, talked about obviously, you know, what was what was being done with, you know, to her patients. It was based on that Netflix documentary where, you know, someone, mm. um, you know, another nurse became a serial killer and how the doc how the institution was willing to protect him yep. because they wanted to protect their reputation and not take accountability because of funding. Yeah. So as long well, as it's capitalism, that's the thing. It's a competitive environment. You're yeah. competing for a, a limited pool of money. money. So, so you don't want any get in the way of that. Once you're reliant on government funds or, you know, or, or, you know, funds from um, stakeholders, then you and know that the that you can't say the justification of I can't save other people's lives and I can't can't do this job properly if we don't have the funding. So I can't damage um, yeah. the relationships with the people that are providing the funding, and I must keep up appearances because and not take accountability because then we're in complete disaster and it becomes a yeah. cycle and cycle and I suppose that's why as long as we on a society level continue to operate in the same um, system then it's very very hard to see a solution yeah it's there's very little incentive to show accountability in the way that we're talking about um, because there's so much at risk and that institution can cease to exist if they, you know, if whoever the representative is, spokesperson is, admits all these things that are actually probably true across every industry and so many of the institutions in those industries. Like nursing, lateral aggression among women is the most studied in nursing because there's such harshness and bullying between seniors and juniors. It's part of this kind of rite of passage where, you know, you get put through hell um, as a junior to become a senior and then they repeat the cycle. Um, I also heard the similar similar situation in military, senior women um, bullying junior women. Uh, you know, it's just like, this is the way that will get you the most prepared. It's, we're not, in the, you know, if you're nursing, you're not in the military, you're here to care and support the healing of patients. Uh, it's not going to happen very easily in contexts that are rife with aggression and bullying. Patients pick up on that. They feel it. It's in the air. It's in everything. It's pervasive. So it's countering the impact that they're trying to, that they're wanting to have. Mm. Um, but it's inbuilt. It's baked in. And it requires 
everyone to just kind of wake up and go, wow, I don't want to be doing this anymore, but everyone has to do it or yeah. majority have to do it in order yeah. for anything to, to possibly change yeah. or stop hurting each other. That's right. I mean, things have to, you know, people have to acknowledge it, that there is in some organizations, a kind of initiation process that mm. this mentality that you've got to pass the bullying test or you've got to earn your way mm. and prove that mm. you really want this. You really want to, you know, survive. You've got to survive the culture rather yeah. than admitting that the culture is the actual problem. Yeah. And it's, you know, the increased rate of suicide among nurses since, you know, a year ago. So it's like, the, the unwellness is getting worse. The illness is getting worse within the institution. How many people need to die or get really sick or traumatized before there's a massive shakeup, but who will be doing the shaking up? Every institution functions this way. Mm. Even the regulatory bodies have huge bullying problems and like, who, who? So it's us, individual, not wait for some external authority. We, you know, it comes back to our own integrity and how do I want to live in this world? How do I want to, how do I, what impact do I want to have on other people? You know, that's the only thing I'm in control over. Not, not how people feel about me, but what I can do, how I behave, how I choose to relate to others. I'm all, only, I can be in control of that. And even if someone's being aggressive towards me, I don't need to be aggressive back. I have different strategies I can use to, you know, deal with that, but I don't have to do it by hurting or, you know, doing the same thing back to them because I get locked into this cycle and I never escape it. So it requires some awareness and some development of, you know, a, a maturing of our self-defensive and self-protective responses so that we are seeking to connect or at least be more realistic about what we can do with this other person, um, which is like, I can still be warm and friendly with you, but I can see that you're not capable to relate with me. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, have a bit of a quite a distance from you, emotional distance from you, but I'm still going to do what uh, is required from my end to work with you, but with strong boundaries, you know, without taking a shit. Um, so that, that requires quite a bit of work and ego management and resistance and restraint to be able to do stuff like that. Cause we're going against a culture that is pro toxicity, even though the culture will never admit that, but that's what it is. So we have to do everything to resist and transgress all these all these uh, ways that want us to become like it. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> the thing is, Natalie, like you have said that that's the take, that that's what you do and you take personal responsibility. But like you said, that it takes a lot of work to be able to get to that place, to be able to have those boundaries. And so, like I said before, it all then comes back to the connection to self and be willing to do that self-awareness work as well as do the work to improve your self-worth. Because if your self-worth is not good enough, then you don't have the security and the courage to be able to put in boundaries, mm -hmm. to not just comply, to go against the status quo. You know, like you, like we said earlier on, that a lot of this stems from insecurity and a lot of the bullying mm -hmm. stems from feeling insecure. So the well, always, is, it, it always comes from that, unless you're dealing with a psych, like a psychopath where they don't feel insecure, they feel on top of the world and they just do whatever they want so those are the exceptions but most of the time it's coming from this unconscious uh you know reactive state and i'm just doing this to protect myself and defend myself but i not real i don't realize i'm doing i'm that's what i'm doing yeah so yeah. yeah i mean i think that so when you think about what can be done you know like if we wind this up and go full circle and go well we've looked at it like this doom and gloom and nothing can be done. And maybe that's, maybe that's true. Maybe it's impossible, but let's look at the flip side for a minute and go on a little bit of hope and go on an individual level, at least what can be stopped done to stop the women on women aggression or just, you know, bullying in general, but for this conversation, women on women aggression, like, you know, yeah. What's what I said, it's just aware of, 
my the effect that I have, the effect of me on other person. So if my if I hear something, what's my you know reaction when I'm shocked or surprised? Do I go into judgment? You know, I'm judgmental about that person I've just heard about, or do I just go, oh, that's interesting, okay, and just be aware of my judgments that are forming in my mind, but I don't verbalize them okay, to so that- you know whoever's telling me. So that you know, it's it's an impulse control. Impulse management. So, so let's let's go into that a little bit further because that's all easy to say. It's an impulse control. Let's observe ourselves. Let's let's you know ask ourselves a lot of questions. Why do we do this? Is this you know how am I feeling today? All these different things. But what actual tools in those situations can you share that say if you had a client and you know, it's all good to say everyone's got to do the work, but what's the work? Like, is the work just getting a whole lot of tools in place? What are the tools? How do we practice them? And obviously we can't go through all of them, but mm. just let's highlight a few things that people can take away and start trying. Well, that's one of them. Just becoming aware of the, the normal way I react to things. So I hear something. Uh, so Lisa, you might say to me, so let's let's see, we're doing an exercise right now, right live where you're wanting me to help me become aware of some of my, you know, involuntary or automatic reactions to things. So you're going to tell me something shocking to, you know, that's going to shock me about someone we both know. And I'm going to go, well, I'll have this automatic response to this thing you said. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go, wow. Or you'll feed back to me. Wow. Now that was your automatic response. What do you think about that? So I'm going to go, wow, that wasn't really, that wasn't a very nice thing to say about that person. Wow, look at all the judgment I'm having about this person. Wow, there's my internal misogyny right there. There's, you know, I need to discover what are my underlying beliefs and things um, that's causing me to react in a certain way. Because if I'm in a workplace, that's stuff I'm going to do. And if I'm a person of influence in that workplace context, then I'm going to be influencing what is permissive in this little environment. Mm. Or if someone does that, they're, they're, exhibiting what is permitted in this environment so then it can easily become us just talking shit about other people because that we've just modeled this is okay so Mm -hmm. i as a person of influence knowing i have some level of influence i need to become alert to my automatic reactions and my judgments and my things where i might be you know misogynistic or man-hating or whatever that isn't going to be helpful because these are all forms of aggression because i have obviously when you told me that shocking thing, it hit, it triggered something that made me want to protect myself. And that's what I did. So I need to become aware of my automatic responses. That is the work. That is the starting point. I need to know what my triggers are and how I react to them. And only then can I know, okay, this is my reaction. I don't like that that's my reaction because I could see it has all these impacts. Um, and therefore, what are the strategies that I could replace that reaction with? What are some of the things? So my reaction could go, wow, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing to hear. Thanks for letting me know. Instead of, wow, what a bitch, you know? (laughs) So, wow, that's interesting. And I leave it there. So that is already an improvement or a shift from what I was doing, which is like icky judgment to, okay. Now it's different if I'm just between you and I as a friend privately. We're going to be more ourselves and we're not necessarily going to, you know, bring it out into a wider conversation we're talking about a workplace context where there's you know there's a a different purpose in a workplace than there is in a friendship and so that's what I'm talking about we need to be aware of what I do how I react and how that comes across to people and I won't know that unless I get feedback from people about their experience of me because I want to know not because I'm trying to please people but I want to make sure that I'm not promoting certain norms that is going to contribute to this aggression problem. So I have to take responsibility for my contribution to this overall culture of unwellness and aggression and toxicity. Mm. That's all I can do and hope that others will want to do the same. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I I really agree with you. And one of the, just to add to that, I suppose, and take it a step further and offer people a practical exercise maybe that they can do in that to, to, start that process happening that I offer sometimes with clients is to spend say 
commit to a week, just a week to be a witness of yourself and even just journal about that or not journal if that's something you don't like to do or want to do, but without judgment. So just a week of observation, not try to change it, not judge it, not anything, but just a week of observing your behaviours. And I think that that is a really good starting place to just come back to yourself and realise because I think that a lot of people do not realise the way that they Mm. speak to people, do not realise even their body position, you know. Am I continuously like this and with my shoulders up and my shoulders, my chest um, contracted? Or, you know, am I, is my chest mm. open and my shoulders down? Like, how is I'm my body that now. <laughs> How am I, how am I, you know, am I open? Mm. Am I expansive? Am I all protective and contracted? Am mm. I, you know, what's the tone of my voice like? Do I raise it quickly? Do I lower it more? Mm. Am I, am I, do I have a look on my face of disdain? Or do I just have a look of curiosity and openness? Like what are the words that are coming out as my first reactions? Like there's so many things that people Mm. can observe about themselves. And, you know, I think that that's a really good starting place to not have judgment because we can go into the inner critic really quickly and that's not going to be helpful. So if you can just start by just doing observation and then go into, all right, wow, wow. Okay, so I do that. Oh, I do that. Oh, I could improve that. And then go into maybe looking at ways and working with somebody to look at like yourself, Matt, or like me, where you can look at alternative options of, you know, how can I behave differently in those situations? So, And the other thing I'll add to that is the comments on my post about denial of woman on woman aggression and bullying, as well as the post about women on woman bullying. Not one person, it, well, majority of the comments were, oh my God, that happened to me. I have stories, stories, stories. So I have lots of comments from people like identify as the victim of bullying, but not one comment was coming from anyone about having been the perpetrator. But the reality is if you've been the victim, you've also been perpetrating because aggression goes two ways. You can't just be like, I'm always nice. I'm never aggressive. Of course, you're going to be self-defensive and reactive. This is our. This is part of what we do. So there'll be time, there'll be lots of times that we would have exhibited and, you know, a- aggression, but no one ever admits it. So we have to admit, we have to go. It's likely that I'm, I've been the perpetrator of some of these behaviors. And this is what I need to change if I don't want to, you know, for me to be able to manage uh, what happens when someone's trying to do that to me, I need to stop being in denial of the fact that I'm a perpetrator. I've been a perpetrator yeah. too. Maybe not of the extreme bullying, but of aggression, which can escalate to bullying unknowingly, unintentionally, but because I'm trying to defend myself in a context that is competitive and is limited in resources, and I want to be able to succeed in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's that deep shadow work to really, you know, bring to light, you know, what we see in someone else is actually just a part of ourselves. And you know, where am I, where have I behaved like that and own that so that you can actually mm. then work with the other person it's 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 big work and mm. i suppose you're right until people start to do that work and instill until also people start especially women maybe for this situation start redefining success um you know like we talked about before like why why do you even want to be there like why have you thought that that to get to the top of an organization is you know has made you become you know, define yourself then as being successful, you know, redefining Mm. terms, um, you know, really having these deep conversations, taking accountability and starting to, you know, just pause. Everybody just needs to hit the pause button and go, (laughs) you know, what's going on? What's Mm. going on with me? What's going on with the other person and what's going on with the culture? And then, you know, obviously, you know, how is it all playing out and, you know what are the what are the dynamics that are that that are occurring and how can what can we do to change that? Mm. <gasps> so much, Nat. So much. There is always so much in our conversations, and there are so many episodes that we've recorded before that touch on a lot of these themes, like the ego management. We did a episode on that as well. So, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank for- you 
having the courage to call all of this out and to stand stand um, true to yourself and not side with any corporation or organisation and just try to do your part in bringing awareness to um, to this bullying culture and how how so much of it is happening with women on women and the need that we need to start coming on board together, that we now mm. need to, you know, be being on the same team to really bring out about a change. Mm. So thank you Agreed. for so many of your valuable insights. Thanks, Lisa. Always a great chat. <laughs> yes. So I'm sure that in listening to this conversation and if you've stayed with us until this point, um, I know that it's been a long conversation, but if you've stayed to us to this point, I'd love to, or we'd both love to hear what your insights are. What are your takeaways? What are your experiences? Please leave a comment, let us know and, um, and continue the conversation. So if you want to find out a little bit more about Natalie, you can visit her website at Dr. NatalieMarshneck.com, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Or you can subscribe to her incredible Hacking Narcissism publication on Substack. I will put both of those links in the show notes. And um, Natalie, if you can just tell the listeners quickly about your upcoming Navigating Workplace Narcissism series. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so there'll be a series of our workshops online uh to delve into different aspects of workplace culture so some many of the things that lisa and i touched on in our conversation today developing awareness how to uh, interrupt behaviors how to detect narcissistic behavior how to um, manage imposter syndrome lots of different things um in order to help you get smarter with navigating workplaces and the relationships in them uh, as well as interrupting or how to detect the early signs of aggression that can potentially escalate to bullying and to get out of it and how to prevent becoming uh, the victim of a knowledge vampire. So uh, those are some of the, the topics in the series. And how will people know about it and when it's happening and be part of it? I will be uh, promoting it on Substack and my various socials on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram. Excellent. Well, I'll put all those links in the show notes below as well. Make sure that you go and follow, follow Natalie. She's putting out so much content on this topic and similar topics. And her take is full of so much wisdom as and so many insights. And she definitely, like I said in the beginning, likes to bring light to a lot of those um, conversations that otherwise would be sitting in the shadows or the content that would be sitting in the shadows. So thank you again so much, Natalie. And, you know, it's so obvious why I love having these conversations with you. So if you've, oh, enjoyed, you. if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and consider subscribing to the Wealthy Living Podcast on both iTunes and YouTube or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. To find out more about my services, you can visit my website at wealthyliving.com.au or connect with me on any of my social media channels. So until next time, remember, connection is medicine. <laughs>